going to move past um, the rotational. And now I want to talk about um, why the width, okay? Why do these peaks have width? So we always talk about how in quantum mechanics, these transitions are exactly quantized, okay? So if they're exactly quantized, then why aren't they narrowly, you know, infinitely narrow is what I should say, right? A single peak, right, with no width. Why do they have some width? Um, well, as you might guess, it has to do with the temperature, okay? Um, and more formally, so this is what we call line widths. So this is a random, you know, section out of chapter 9.6. Apologies for the different orders. Um, but there's two main effects contributing to why spectra actually have width. This Doppler broadening is only relevant for gases. Because if you recall, the Doppler effect is um, the change in frequency of an object as it's traveling away or to an observer. And you've all observed this all the time, right? The classic example is like the ambulance or the police car, right? That's driving by you, right? You can hear it's the frequency of the siren change as it's approaching you and then as it's receding from you, right? So that's due to the Doppler effect. Um, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time going through these equations. The main thing that I wanna uh, get into and point out is all of these equations lead to a width. So that delta lambda, right, that is the spread in lambda. So I'll note it um, on this figure here, right? So if I look at the width of this, um, that is my delta lambda, okay? Um, because, right, we recognize, or here this is, excuse me, delta frequency on this graph. I'll label that appropriately, right? So we could think of it, though, as a delta... Um, Lambda, we could think of it as a delta frequency. We could think of it as a delta energy, right? It's some width of that otherwise would be, you know, infinitely sharp, right? This would be our infinitely sharp peak, okay? So, um, and you can see there's definitely some Boltzmann stuff going on there, right, with the 2KT. Um, and the important thing to note, as you might expect, right, the colder a molecule is, the sharper its peaks are. And that's due to its random chaotic Brownian motion, right? Whether it's moving towards the observer, and in this case, the observer is the spectrometer, right? So if we draw like our detector right here, okay? And I'm passing light through my sample and to my detector, you know, I could have molecules moving away from my detector and absorbing this light. I could have molecules moving towards my detector, right? Um, and of course, in a random sample of gases, we'll have all angles in between, right? It'll be moving chaotically. So this owes to, um, at, at the very least with gases, in particular microwave spectroscopy, as well as gases in infrared spectroscopy, having an actual width, okay? So another factor, um, and this affects all phases, okay, and most importantly, the high energy transitions are most affected by lifetime broadening. And what we mean here by lifetime broadening is the amount of time a state spends in that upper lying level, okay? So if we think about this like an electronic level, for example, where I've got, um, I'll just use N to make this simple. Let's say we've got N equals two, N equals one, and we promote some electron to this state, okay? If we could keep track in time, um, so I'll say like I'll use, uh, uh, let's say N of state two, right? If we could keep track of this, molecule, the population of molecules in state two over time, we would see that it follows a first order decay. 
So all excited states decay via a first order process. And so from that first order process, we can get tau, the lifetime, which hopefully you remember from your kinetics, the lifetime of any first order process is just one over the rate constant for that process, okay? And so now the, the broadening, and so you can see here, this is given as delta E, so the width of the transition is just simply h bar divided by its lifetime. And I've got some more um, calculations here just to kind of demonstrate this point. Um, and so a typical lifetime for an electronic state, so let's write that down. So for the electronic levels, a typical lifetime is about 10 to the minus eight seconds. Now the amount of time it takes to access that state is really fast. It's actually like an atto second. That's like 10 to the minus 18 seconds. But it will live in that state for, you know, approaching a nanosecond or really like 10 nanoseconds, okay? So it'll take about 10 nanoseconds for all of the molecules to decay back down to the ground state. And of course, they're releasing light in that process. And the light that is released in that process will have some breadth it will be it have it'll have some uncertainty to it based on this lifetime okay and so here you can see i've calculated that um so i've said my delta e is just um h bar right which is h divided by 2 pi times tau um and i uh have converted that um well actually i ended up deleting that because it was confusing um to do delta lambda so let's just do it as delta e and then this factor right here converts it into an electron volt, just so we can kind of get an idea of easy numbers to use. Um, and you notice here, when I make the lifetime 10 to the minus eight seconds, there is an uncertainty in that transition, a width of about 10 to the minus eight electron volts. That's pretty small in the grand scheme of things, okay? Pretty, pretty small. But what happens if maybe I increase that lifetime by, you know, a factor of 10? Um, so now you can see that that width is getting bigger, right? So and if I go to 10 to the minus 10 for my lifetime, so now I'm making it even shorter, a really fast lifetime. You can see now that width Right, because of this inverse relationship, that width is getting bigger. So the faster our molecules decay, the more uncertainty there is in where its peak should appear, all right? Now, what about microwave rotationals? Okay, lifetimes for microwave transitions are on the order of 10 to the three seconds. That is a humongous amount of time. That's like, 20 minutes, you guys. That is a huge amount of time. And so now when you think about that one, if we put in 10 to the three, and look at this, this is still in electron volts. 10 to the minus 19 electron volt uncertainty, okay? And so what's going on here is the longer a state spends in that lifetime, the more certain it is. We know that it's in that lifetime, okay? and it stays there for a long time. So there's less uncertainty about its, you know, where its position occurs on the energy scale. But the faster something is, the more chaotic it is, the more that it goes through these excitations and then emissions and excitations and emissions, the bigger the width is that we have, okay? Um, so this was a pretty short lecture and I think that's a pretty good place to wrap it up because where we're going next is molecular vibrations, all right? I'll see you in the discussion of vibrational spectroscopy.